Welcome to the Kotki Ride Home for Friday, May 14th, 2021. I'm Jackson Bird. What a new lawsuit against TikTok says about the rights of actors who lend their likenesses to AI and similar projects. How nostalgia could help you make connections when you return to the office. And what is even the point of wasps? Here are some of the cool things from the news today. So, following up on the story earlier this week about the voice actor behind Amazon's Alexa potentially being revealed, a story has now broke about another voice actor whose work was allegedly taken by a major platform without her permission. Now, first, I want to reiterate something that I shared in the story earlier this week. So, Susan Bennett, the voice of the original Siri, did not know that she was recording components of vocal sounds that would be used by Apple, let alone for a brand new technology they'd be putting in all of their devices. She was just doing another job for the studio she'd long worked with. She thought it was a kind of advanced text-to-speech project for a random company. She didn't know she had become the voice of Siri until Siri was public and friends started recognizing her voice. Now, while I don't have complete evidence for it, it seems, based on Brad Stone's reporting, that the same thing happened with the voice actor behind Alexa, who was also working with a larger agency used by Amazon for the product. Now, while Bennett reviewed all the contracts that she signed and determined she was allowed to go public when she decided she was ready, I have my suspicions that Amazon's contracts for the woman behind the Alexa voice are a bit more restrictive. Either that or the woman doesn't want to be public, which is totally legit. I am also making an assumption here that somewhere in the paperwork signed by those two and by other actors whose voices have gone to newer and international versions of virtual assistants, there was language about eventual usage and their waiving of rights to their work. But that may not be the case with the latest voice actor to come forward. Ontario-based Beverly Standing has discovered that her voice is being used to say anything and everything on one of the most widely used newer features on TikTok. The feature is a basic text-to-speech one, and if you've seen any TikToks over the past few months, you've probably encountered it. It's a sort of robotic-sounding woman's voice that reads aloud the text someone puts on their TikTok. Its ubiquity has become a bit of a meme in and of itself, and personally, I have a theory that one reason it's so popular, apart from the accessibility that it engenders, is that it enables people to have a voice reciting their TikTok without them having to say anything. So if someone is out in public or recording something in their bedroom and don't want other household members to overhear, this feature is a great way to silently record a quick video and add a voice to it after the fact. I think its popularity speaks to how much everyone touting audio-forward social media platforms right now have underestimated just how many people are at least moderately uncomfortable speaking their opinions aloud in their own homes. But that's a rant for another day. The point is, this feature is super popular. And since the voice will read anything you write, you can imagine how it's being used to say inappropriate and offensive stuff on occasion. And that is the main crux on which Standing has filed a lawsuit against ByteDance, TikTok's parent company, saying that she didn't authorize them to use her voice and that such usage has caused her, quote, irreparable harm and the emotional distress of having her likeness exploited without her consent, loss of the ability to control the dissemination of her likeness, and loss of the ability to control the association of her likeness, end quote. Now, I do have to say, the Polish actor I mentioned on Tuesday who recorded his voice for Ivona's original text-to-speech feature had a similar complaint when his voice started being used inappropriately by pranksters. He threatened to withdraw his voice from the software, so Ivona coughed up more money to keep using it. And that's part of it here. As far as I've been able to verify thus far, the voice actors behind these ubiquitous virtual assistants don't actually get paid a ton. They got paid once, like for any other gig, and that's it. By Standing's account, it's not that she's filing a lawsuit just as a shakedown, it's more that she's frustrated that she wasn't technically reimbursed for how her voice recordings are now being used, a usage she might not have consented to had she been aware of its full scope. But how did her voice get to be used by TikTok to begin with? 
From The Verge, quote, Standing says that she did voice recordings for a text-to-speech feature several years ago for a group called the Institute of Acoustics, or IOA. Those recordings were meant to be used for translations of Chinese texts as part of a contract with an unnamed Chinese company, the lawsuit says. Standing says she did not authorize the IOA to transfer her voice data to other parties for later use. It's unclear which IOA the lawsuit is referring to. A Google search reveals two groups with the same name, one based in England and another based in China. The lawsuit says it's based in Edinburgh, Scotland. The capital of Scotland is Edinburgh. Fast forward to the end of 2020, and Standing discovers that her voice seemed to have become a viral sensation online. Standing says she discovered her voice was being used in November 2020, although TikTok does not appear to have publicly announced the feature until December 2020. End quote. So there's some fishy details there, but the larger point remains, quoting the BBC. Actors' performances, including vocal performances, are protected by copyright, Joanna Conboyne, intellectual property and technology partner at Spencer West, said. So a voice artist should have a claim under copyright if their performance is used without their permission. A key question is where the voice artist's content was obtained from. In commercial situations, copyright is often assigned to another business. But even if that's the case, the voice artist or actor normally retains moral rights, which should ensure that they are recognized as the person performing. End quote. And Standing's lawyer pointed out to the BBC that this is going to continue to be a growing problem as artificial intelligence continues to develop, whether it's public figures' likenesses being manipulated or actors lending their voices for an AI to build off of. We'll need to continually revisit laws around likeness, usage, rights, and proper compensation. But, her lawyer notes, it's one thing for established actors and public figures to be affected, and quite another for more ordinary people like Standing, whose modest career is at risk due to potential harm caused by her voice's likeness and the way it's now being used. Standing told Insider, quote, The whole point of me going this public, it's not about the money overall. By going public, I'm hoping I'm sharing with the end users, the clients, the people that are doing the other end of it, realizing that this is my livelihood, and I'm behind this mic every single day working, training, teaching. You can't just take it. End quote. And I do have to say, at the very least, anything that reminds us of the real humans behind features we take for granted is a good thing in my book. Whether you're returning to in-person work or starting a new job, you may find yourself soon struggling to connect with coworkers, especially if you've spent the last year working remotely or with less people around than usual. Career coach Stephanie Heath and corporate social responsibility expert Susan McPherson emphasized to CNN last month that connecting with coworkers is good for trust, good for your own enjoyment of work or strengthening your career, and ultimately, good for the company. They recommend having a few work-appropriate conversation starters ready if you're feeling a bit rusty with socializing. McPherson suggests some that might be more social, like, is there somewhere in the world you're planning to visit? And others more professional, like, is there anything I can do to help you? Heath recommends getting a little vulnerable. Quote, For instance, telling someone about how you felt awkward at your first social gathering since the pandemic began can help break the ice. When you share something that's semi-embarrassing and start with that, it invites the other person to start sharing, Heath said. End quote. Or if you want another work-safe embarrassing topic, the BBC recommends using nostalgia to forge deeper connections with coworkers. This could be cultural nostalgia points like old bands and movies, the BBC name checks the Spice Girls, or company-specific nostalgia like fun moments or big achievements from the past. Clay Rutledge, a professor of management at North Dakota State University, tells the BBC that nostalgia is a very social-emotional experience. Quoting the BBC, Because of its connection to other people, nostalgia can prime us to deepen relationships or build new ones by putting us in the mood to connect with people. It reminds us of our social nature, Rutledge says, and puts the social side of us out front. Collective nostalgia can link people who don't have familial or friendship bonds through pop culture or events in broader society that they've all experienced. In fact, nostalgia can be a unique tool for bringing diverse groups of people together, including in the workplace where it's potentially useful for fostering bonds between colleagues." End quote. And it doesn't all have to be positive. Bonding over a shared memory of a failed project or bad former boss works too. 
Though nostalgia for particularly bright moments at the company can fire people up to work harder and be motivated to work together. And quoting again, research has shown that nostalgia goes a long way toward increasing creativity, too. People who feel connected socially, in effect of nostalgia, are more likely to act confidently and take risks with their work, explains Rutledge, end quote. Now, there is, of course, a downside to nostalgia. For one, a lot of people get annoyed by too much nostalgia, so that might not be fostering a totally harmonious workplace. And a lot of companies also prefer to be forward-thinking and not dwell too much on the past. Lakshmi Renjarajan, a New York-based workplace and employee connection consultant, also points out that nostalgia can lead to revisionist history. She said, quote, what nostalgia can do sometimes is gloss over what was problematic. Remembering how your growth was interconnected with other people is great, but it has to be taken with a dose of, what did we not do right? I think nostalgia is this idea of things and moments we miss. I think we also have to be like, okay, and what did we miss? End quote. But if used in that critical way, it can be especially powerful for creating nostalgia-worthy moments going forward. No revisionist history necessary. And nostalgia may be particularly effective right now, because, Rutledge notes, nostalgia is especially common when we're lonely and craving interaction, aka how many people felt over the past year. And we've seen that nostalgia has been big for lots of people. So you probably can't go wrong with discussing the old TV shows you've rewatched or older music you've been listening to. More than likely, someone else in your workplace was doing the same. And bam, now you've got something to talk about besides which flavor of vaccine you got. There are some pests and insects out there that are so annoying, I sometimes find myself trying to justify their existence. You know, like, alright, spiders eat some insects, so that's great, they can stay. And flies help with pollination, okay, fine. But what about wasps? Do we really need wasps? According to a recent study in the journal Biological Reviews, we really, really do. The study analyzed 500 scientific reports on the 33,000 different hunting wasp species, a subsection of the over 100,000 total known wasp species, representing the first major review of the ecosystem benefits that wasps provide. And the results, as The Guardian summarizes, wasps, like spiders, are great predators of other insects. And like bees, they help pollinate plants. But more than that, they also produce antibiotics in their venom. And, as we all know from the multitude of articles promoting murder hornet recipes last year, wasps also make a nutritious snack. But despite all of their benefits, people don't tend to think kindly about wasps. And not just on a personal level. They're often overlooked in industries that could really benefit from them. Quoting The Guardian, Recent research found that common hunting wasps can control the fall armyworm that attacks maize crops in Brazil and a borer moth that eats sugarcane. The use of other predatory insects to protect crops is estimated to be worth more than $400 billion a year, but hunting wasps have barely been considered, the scientists found." End quote. And as far as that antibiotic in their venom, Syrian Sumner, a professor at University College London and a co-author on the study, told The Guardian that this characteristic is found primarily in solitary wasps, which make up most of the hunting wasp species. About a thousand of the species, including yellow jackets and hornets, are social wasps. Quoting The Guardian, Solitary wasps are super cool. Their venom has an incredible cocktail in it that paralyzes the prey and also has lots of antibiotics in it, said Sumner. Many solitary wasps bury their eggs with paralyzed prey to provide food once hatched, so they want to make sure the food is properly preserved. The antimicrobial properties of wasp venom, saliva, and larval secretions have long been recognized in traditional medicine." End quote. And as for pollination, the study found 960 plant species that were regularly visited by hunting wasps. 164 of those were entirely dependent on the wasps for pollination, including orchids which, quote, attract male wasps by mimicking the back end of a female wasp, end quote. And all of these services that wasps provide could become more and more important as insect populations writ large decline, but wasps continue to hold strong. 
Despite their many benefits, however, wasps are still dangerous. Summoner says she has to take extra precautions around them because they'll sneak into gaps in clothing that bees never even attempt. And she shares that she had a PhD student that got stung 186 times. So, they don't have a great track record. And The Guardian notes our prejudice goes back far. Wasps are sent as a punishment by God repeatedly throughout the Bible, and Aristotle wrote, quote, Hornets and wasps have nothing divine about them as the bees have, end quote. But Sumner is trying to prove Aristotle wrong, saying, quote, We're quite happy with the idea that bees sting because we know that they do good in the world. So we've gathered the evidence available to put wasps on the map in terms of their ecosystem services. Wasps could be just as valuable as other beloved insects like bees if we only gave them more of a chance. End quote. So you know how Tom Cruise is going to space this fall in an attempt to get closer to his Scientology god Xenu? Or actually, to shoot the first feature film in space on board the International Space Station. It's wild, I know, I keep wiping this information from my brain every time I hear it because I can barely process that it's real. Well, shortly after that announcement last year, Russia announced that they too are going to shoot a feature film on the International Space Station and that they will do it first. The Russian director and actor it was just announced will be traveling to the ISS on October 5th, while Tom Cruise and director Doug Lyman's NASA and SpaceX-funded flight is currently set for an unknown date in October. So there literally might be two film crews shooting rival movies on the International Space Station this fall, as harried editors back on the ground rush to beat one another to a fine cut in one of the more absurd reincarnations of the space race yet. I swear, if a new Cold War kicks off because of Tom Cruise, I mean, just where does comedy even go from there? All of that said, I mean, I guess movies shot in space would be kind of cool. They should definitely hire Kevin Feige for their PR so he can excitedly point out to everyone how it's all right out of a camera with no VFX work to it at all. But until then, I'm just gonna keep rewatching Colonel Chris Hadfield's Space Oddity music video from the ISS because I don't think anything will ever be better than that. And that is it for this week. As always, this show was produced by Ride Home Media and Kotki.org. I am Jackson Bird, and I will talk to you again on Monday. Have a great weekend.